Welcome to The Retail Code. We help retail leaders accelerate profitability, resilience, and competitive advantage. My name is Lisa Amlani, Principal and Founder of the Retail Strategy Group, where we help retailers optimize organizational effectiveness in areas such as product creation, line planning, and merchandising to get closer and faster to the customer. This is Gary Newberry. Gary, please introduce yourself. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, I work with board and business leaders to navigate disruption and reinvigorate the supply chain performance. So there's there's a lot of nuances um, that are happening, but it seems to me that the media is is covering only one variable out of this whole big picture. Yeah. And we're just talking about ports and we're just talking about the labor shortage around truckers or staff within a DC. And you know, we have a big, big problem in those areas, absolutely. But that's what even the government is focusing on if you see, you know, what what the reports around the state of the union address and how they're going to they want to get, you know, everyone in a room and including those private organizations, the targets and Walmarts of the world to help solve this problem. But they may not be the ones to solve the problem because the last time I went into a Walmart or checked targets online inventory, they seem like they're doing they're doing pretty well. What do you think about that? Yeah, just going back to the point you made on what the government's talking about, it's talking about trying to free up the reports, switching them from the current agreement with the unions to actually widen those agreements to allow 724 workings. Good luck. I think the government, and this happened in the UK, just going into a great recession on, on the, the national broadcast of the BBC, they were incredibly negative going into the, the great recession. They were saying, oh, you know, another 2,000 jobs lost. They weren't actually talking about the ones going into the recession, but were actually percolating up and recruiting still. So the government actually intervened and said, look, uh, it would be helpful for you to help calm people down because the, the worst you, thing you can do in a recession is to talk us into a recession and it, it uh, the whole thing about recession it's it's an, an idea of confidence if you're confident you won't get into a recession but if you're unconfident the more you think we're going into a hole the more deeper you'll get quicker so i think the message from the government is that we're in control of this we are doing some things here but don't worry we, we, we are, we're going to get through this we've got working committees of retailers working with us, helping us through this situation, giving us good information so we can make the right choices. So that's, I think, the first point that the government could do a, a much better job, both, probably both sides of the border. Beyond that, I think what we're going to see is a sort of it, more polarity. Oh my goodness, we've already had polarity in the retail industry. We had the, the big apex retailers, the, you know, the Amazon, the Target, the Walmart, the ones that have already, to an extent, digitally transformed before the pandemic, and it just accelerated their, their speed to get to where they need to be. Whereas quite a lot of people were just faced with oops, we have to get onto Shopify or do something like this and, you know, get Instacart to do our stuff for us rather than actually go through the formal process of digitally transforming, which would maybe put them in a stronger position had they done this early stages of the pandemic. 18 months into this, you would imagine that digital transformation process would have been advanced. So we're going to get polarity here. We're going to get the big boys organised and you're going to get the mid-range companies, say, people in, in Canada, you have know, Indigos and Roots and, 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 you know, the companies that sort of not that huge like Loblaws, but not tiny like, you know, the mom and pop stores, the ones in between, the ones trapped in that uh, unenviable position of having a certain amount of scale, but still relying on, you know, geographically extended supply chain. So from the Far East, but haven't got the weight behind them when they say you must get your stuff made, get it in a container and get it onto that boat so we can come over here so we can get it off that boat uh, and get it into our into our distribution network. I think that they're the ones that are most vulnerable. If they're not buying locally, they're probably out of luck. Yeah, I think so too. I think that's where we we really need to put some of our efforts in finding solutions for these newly created digitally native brands and the the local mom and pops but any any business that's a small business that has 
I'd say, you know, less than 10 stores or is just, you know, a digitally native brand. I think that's where we need to think about solutions around sourcing, diversifying some of that vendor base and where raw materials are coming from, because that is also a huge contributor to the supply chain disruption that's happening today. Not only is it sustainable if you understand where your goods are coming from, because then you can, you know, take action on uh, things like transparency and ethical ways of, of sourcing product and, and making product. But I think that there's a huge opportunity here to change the consumer mindset, to think about how are we shopping? The one thing that stood out to me that you said was that you had changed your shopping habits, even though you may be buying the same amount of product, but you're going to the store more frequently. So that means you are being marketed uh, for product, double the amount that you would have when you're going to the store every 10 days. I'd say the same is the same would apply to me that, you know, we've, we've actually started to go to Costco, which, you know, I'd never really been going to before, but I wouldn't say we're panic buying, but we're just buying bulk instead of the, the typical city life where you just buy when you need it every few days, right? So I think that changing the consumer mindset, thinking about, do you really need product versus, you know, hoarding or <laughs> uh, storing a product? Because I think that once we change the consumer mindset that we don't need as much as we, as we actually buy, I think that will start to change the way retailers think about seasonal and non-seasonal products. And of course, frequency of new. I think there's a lot to be said on, and we've, we've talked about this many times, about how we think about seasons and how often yes. we're dropping deliveries. And what does that mean in terms of sustainability and of course, transparency and visibility of inventory? Yes. Let's start to reduce some of that overbuying, right? Yeah. And one of the, <laughs> the interesting dilemma here is that we can hope that retailers travel that path, but there's somebody sitting behind the scene saying, you've got to make your next quarter, got to make your next quarter, which is typically make, translated into, we need the sales. We need to at least match last year's sales. And some of the things you touched on there require us to see the customer less often which means less sour. So there's some pretty powerful forces to keep things as they are. But if yeah. 18 months of a pandemic and maybe another 18 months ahead of us, assuming that retailers can actually get through this period, let's say that maybe 50% of their uh, inventory arrives broadly as they originally had planned, and the other 50 now is at risk whether or not that gets in too late for Christmas. So it's you know it's arriving before Christmas, but people have found other ways of uh, meeting the requirements, prompted by the sort of media messages out there. Or worse, it comes in after Christmas. It's after Boxing Day. It's in January, and it's uh, this season stock out of season suddenly what do they do so there's some real big tactical issues that retailers have to face up to this is the stuff that you know is is totally my wheelhouse because it's really about planning and changing the way we plan focusing more on in-season planning so you can react to those shifts in the consumer shopping behavior a lot more quickly but also if we think about and you talked about this a little bit if we change our mindset in how we plan and for revenue and increases year over year, that's something that we also need to think about changing, like the fundamentals around actually thinking about our profitability and changing the way we think about markdowns and what we're doing for promotional activities. Now, that's a big ask, I think, for a lot of retailers to change the way we think about you know, Prime Day and Boxing Day, and of course, Black Friday, which is which is coming up. Once we start to shift our mindset, that's when we'll change the way the customer thinks about shopping. And when we can actually see, start to see changes across financial planning and in-season planning is actually going to change the way we look at inventory. Because inventory is a big challenge for retailers right now because we're dealing with a lot of excess. I mean, you look at off-price retailers, they're full. They have goods on the shelves. And that's because we still have an excess inventory problem. Yeah, I, I think that you're addressing to an extent, how do we how do we get rid of the waste? I mean, I think you're particularly talking about apparel, which is one of the most wasteful or inefficient 
uh, supply chain designs uh, that, uh, that is known to man apart from food. Food is probably up there as well. I, I believe the food one or what the apparel one is about 42% of the stuff that starts off as raw materials gets wasted either during the process or by consumers. They overbuy themselves and they never either wear their garment or wear it as often as it could be worn or don't eat the food. It goes out of, out of date. What I was going to share with you was I was approached by a specialty retailer recently and they were looking for somebody with ocean background. And as I talked to them, it was a pretty open conversation about where they found themselves. And it became very clear a, a, a day or two later when I reflected on the conversation. It isn't about ocean. It isn't about road and rail and all these kind of things. It's just a logistics problem that isn't being sorted out clearly enough by making sure we have the right decision-making information at the right time, often we find inside retail or inside any business, we think the information's within our, within our paperwork, it's got to be in here. Whereas actually there's a lot of information externally which can be available in real time, like the shipping movements, you know, real, real schedules, whatever it might be, that we just need, and we've got the ability to do this now, to gather all this fast wave of information, process it through machine learning or AI, artificial intelligence, and start generating correct routing options. So we have more control of our physical logistics or how, where stuff is, is it where it should be in terms of maybe production? Has it been made yet? Is there a container around? Has it found itself onto the back of a skeletal frame trailer? Is there a driver? Is there an attractive unit? Is it which port is it going to go to? What's the cost of doing that? Where's the availability of ship capacity at these different times at different ports? I just don't think people are looking at that in enough detail. I suspect much of the potential risk of uh, stock shortages are we know what we're doing around here. We've been doing the same thing for 10, 15 years, maybe less, but we know that we make it here, we send it to that port. Oh, it's full or we're on rollover. So we, we finally get the product to the port and it's a stack of containers because the ship hasn't got any capacity. We have to wait for the next one to come in and shout at the right person or shout at a freight forwarder, whoever it might be, to get our container onto that boat. That's not how to do things. We have to find where the capacity is. And I, I think that I read in, uh, in one of those reports we've both shared that Walmart was actually taking stuff to a different port as, as a byproduct of this. We can't get it through there. Or they might shift to 724. That's great. But in the short term, we find a different port. So they're looking at re rerouting to get their product off the boat onto a truck somewhere else. Maybe you haven't got such a driver shortage to get it onto railhead, to take it across the country and, and get it into the distribution center. Yeah, I think you bring up actually uh, quite a few great points around infusing flexibility in some of the processes yeah. uh, to change up the way we're doing things because those folks who say we've been doing this for 10 years, we know what we're doing. Well, let's get some new blood in there and think about new ways of working and diversifying who's sitting at that table making those decisions but also involving more people in that round table of decision-making of where product is going and why we're making things in certain factories and not others, but also enabling technology throughout the process from concept and planning to uh, building out assortments, but also understanding where your goods are being made and how you can increase capacity to fulfill some of those peak times in uh, selling, but understanding how we can use AI and machine learning in the best way. And the tools are out there. We know that. It's just a matter of changing mindsets to embrace some of those tools to make better decisions. Thanks everybody for tuning in. You can find both Gary and I on LinkedIn or the retailcode.ca. Have a great day. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. Hit the like button and leave your comments. Connect with us on LinkedIn to get the heads up on future episodes of The Retail Code.